The opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness, it's indifference. The opposite of faith is not heresy, it's indifference. And the opposite of life is not death, it's indifference. And this week's opening quote comes from Eli Weisel. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and I will be your host for the next hour. Recently, you have probably heard me talking quite a bit about history, quite a bit about the lost nation of Tartaria, a nation that existed in Europe that nobody seems to know about. It's a nation that's been expunged from history, and yet it still exists on many maps. Well, it still exists on many old maps anyway. It doesn't exist on too many new maps, but you can still find it on old maps if you search for it. And it does appear to be quite a well-known and well-established nation. Of course, any academic sources that you question about this nation, they will simply tell you it was an area of land that was never actually a nation. And yet, as I've also pointed out previously, we can find flags of this nation. And if it was just an area and not a nation, then it wouldn't have a flag. So it was, in fact, a nation and not simply an area of land. And there's every indication that it had also spread out to become a worldwide civilization. This is very much suggested by the similar architecture in so many countries around the world, very old architecture, which is all very much the same. And this is what it's termed Greco-Roman architecture. But one would ask, why would every country around the world be building their government buildings using the same architecture? You find this everywhere. You find it all through the Americas. You find it through South America. You find it even in Japan and Australia. So why would they be using the same style? That's the question.
And even not just the architecture, but the symbolism, the motifs, the designs, even the clothing, the styles of clothing that people wear, these are all very similar all around the world. They may not seem that way when you first look at them on the surface, but when you really analyse things, you find that they all have a common root, which very much suggests that all of these nations, all of these cultures were all connected. And something else you've heard me talking about a great deal is the evidence suggesting a worldwide mud flood that happened as recently as 150 to 200 years ago. As I've mentioned before, there's a Russian channel run by a man called Philip Druzinen who is covering this quite extensively, and I do recommend you go and look at the research that he's done on this because it is quite compelling. And you'll find that there is evidence of this mud flood that exists everywhere. I mean, it did happen, folks, and it was a physical flood, but it was not water, and it was an event that covered virtually the entire world. We can find evidence of this flood across Europe, across the Americas, even here in Australia. And evidence of this flood appears as buildings that have a sub-level, a level below ground, and also as many of the buildings that look like they were carved into rock faces, look like they were carved into cliffs, there's a very real possibility that they weren't carved into the cliffs, but simply the cliffs flowed over them, or perhaps the cliffs even became molten around them. But however it happened and however it manifested, suffice to say there is a good deal of evidence to indicate that the mud flood is a very, very genuine event, and it's very likely that it occurred in the mid to late 1840s. And there's a lot of people who have been putting a lot of research into this and a lot of information is being uncovered about what has truly happened in the past. And our history appears to be very, very different to what the mainstream has taught us, to what we've learned in academic institutions, what we learned in schools. In fact, none of what we are taught in schools of what our history is, is backed up by physical evidence. All the physical evidence says something quite different. And there may be some people that would debate that. They'd say, well, no, we've got a lot of physical evidence to support the official timeline. But really, when you look at the physical evidence, you can construct any story you want to make it sort of fit with the evidence but you have to leave a great deal of it out which is why there's so many great mysteries and anomalous objects and all the names they think up for all the things they can't explain you know and ultimately folks if there's one artifact that is out of place then the official version is wrong and there are literally hundreds of artifacts that are out of place if the official version is to be believed at all and again these are all sort of listed as anomalous objects and great mysteries and all shrouded in secrecy and presented as something that we just don't know how they did it. But really, if you can face the very real possibility that they don't fit because the timeline and the history that we're given is completely wrong, then you begin to see a little bit of the bigger picture. And it is wrong, folks. Our history is wrong. I have no qualms in saying that. It's completely wrong. Most of it has been completely fabricated, and I would suggest that it's been done absolutely deliberately for a very specific reason. The question is, how did they do it? How did they erase history so effectively? And what really happened? Well, what evidence suggests really happened is, as I said, this mud flood. There was a flood that's gone across the entire world. And the mud flood, because it is mud, it's not water, it appears to have come from the land itself. The question is, how did that occur? Was it a natural occurrence or was it simply done by somebody or something? And the other question is, of course, why can no one remember this? How has it been so effectively expunged from human memory and expunged from our history? Well, as I've said before, how long would it take to change history and hide history? And effectively, it would take three generations, but you could actually do it in one. If you were to remove the older people, well, most of the older people anyway, a high percentage of the population just wipe them out and simply replace them with children. The children wouldn't know what history was, especially if they were children that had just been put in place after some sort of a cataclysm like a mud flood. And these children would believe any history that they were taught. I mean, they wouldn't even have an interest in history to begin with. You'd put them in place, set them to work, and they'd be too caught up in the rigours of everyday survival to ever even question where they come from or what they're doing there. I mean, for a child, it'd just be the way things are. 
they would gradually grow up over generations and you would just teach these new generations this new history. And when you look at the stories of old, the stories of the chimney sweeps and how so many children were working back in the old days and we just thought it was terrible that there was child labour and that's the way they did it, but why was there so many children working? Why weren't the adults there to do the jobs that the children were doing? There's been a lot of photos that have been surfacing lately, a lot of old pictures, and you can go and find them yourself. If you look at any historical photos from around circa 1850, look at St. Petersburg, look at some of the major cities in the United States, major cities in England, major cities right across Europe around circa 1850, and you'll find very, very few people in the photographs. You see these big cities, but there's just no people around. Why is that? And any woman who had a child out of wedlock, circa 1850, was required by law to hand their baby over to a foundling home. And around circa 1860 to 1880, there were literally thousands, tens of thousands of foundlings which were being dropped off at orphanages all across the world. Right across Europe, right across Russia, right across America, even here in Australia, New Zealand and Africa. It was about 200,000 children per annum were shipped from east to west across the United States. And this is what was happening in so-called orphan trains. And they just used to be shipped out there and all the kids would get off the train and people would get up there and pick the children that they wanted and then the train would be reloaded and they'd move on to the next town and they'd pick the children that they wanted. All the children were picked to use for labour. And it didn't matter if the children were related or anything, they were often separated and they were simply given whatever last name the people thought they should have, given whatever first name and last name, kind of by lot. So there's no way of tracing the genealogy of these kids, like if a brother got separated from a sister or siblings got separated at all, if they went to another town, they were given another name and then they grew up and there would be no way they would be able to locate their siblings. So all of them were just completely thrown into a new life. And this was happening all around the world. And there were major enterprises in place set up to manage these children, to care for these children, to ship them all around the place. There's reports of certain cities in Italy, for example, that had up to 1,200 foundling homes in the cities just to accept the influx of foundlings that were coming into the areas. The question is, why? Where were all these children coming from? There's one place or two places, I think, had 45,000 children delivered to them in one year. There's reports of, like I said, 200,000 per annum being shipped across the United States. There's reports of around about 100,000 per annum being shipped out of England to Australia, New Zealand and Africa. There's reports of children being shipped into major cities in Russia and then being sent out to rural areas, which is very strange because if the children were being found in rural areas and then being brought back to major cities in Russia, why were they then shipping them back out to rural areas? And the question is, if these cities are empty and there was very, very few people around, which is very much what is indicated by the photographs that you see, then where were all these children coming from? And again, there's every indication that all of these children were put to work. I mean, that's what is there in the documentation. All of these kids that were shipped everywhere all around the world were all put to work. So again, the question is, where were the adults? Why weren't the adults doing the work? And why exactly would so much labour be needed? You know, in a normal society, in a normal world, if things have gone along the timeline that we're told, and there's just families going out and colonizing new areas, you know, the settlers going out building their log cabins and having children. Why would you need this huge influx of child labor to be sent so many places around the world? It's a very interesting question, ladies and gentlemen, and the question also must be asked, were the children brought into these countries and into these places as labour for the clean-up operation after the mud flood, because there's a great deal of evidence to suggest this is what actually happened. And that many of the stories about colonisation and all of this sort of stuff are very likely cover stories to hide the fact that these children were being shipped all around the world, and the stories of the foundlings even 
of these foundling homes and these vast orphanages and all these things they needed, this is very likely a cover story as well to explain the presence of all of these children. The question is, where were the children coming from? But I think it's extremely interesting, the volume of children that were being shipped around the world and the evidence that exists all around the world to indicate that there was a civilization prior to this one not too long ago and this current civilization simply moved in and took over the real estate. And when I say real estate, what I mean is not just the real estate, but also many of the buildings. And as I've said before, folks, really, when you look at our cities, there's no way these cities were built by us. Some of the architecture is just too old. Some of the architecture is just too complicated by our standards. How do we ever do any of this stuff? I mean, we certainly can't do it today. And some of the architecture here in Australia, it's not possible for the settlers to have built this. They simply wouldn't have had the machinery to be able to quarry the stones to build these huge government buildings, which are very old buildings. We've got buildings here that have been here since the late 1700s, and yet this country is supposed to have been colonised in 1770. And yet by 1778, we've got cities. By the early 1800s, we've got huge cities, and it's just not possible for these cities to have been built in that time. And evidence would suggest that they weren't built in that time. They were already here. We just simply cleaned them up and moved in and took over the real estate. And of course, when you consider that, then you've got to ask the question, well, what happened to all the people that were in the cities before we came and did the cleanup? You know, what happened to everything, folks? What happened to all the technology? You know, some of the technology that exists in these old buildings, and a lot of them, as I've said before, some of the buildings like churches and some of these very, very complex structures you see around the place, they don't really look like buildings. They look like they're machines. They look like they're energy gathering machines. And I think all buildings were designed to actually gather energy. I think free energy was a reality. I think free energy was part of everyday life. And I think that a lot of these structures were designed with that in mind. No were designed to harvest energy from the surrounding field. And I know it sounds a little outrageous, but there's every indication this is what was going on. Have you looked at some of the old fireplaces in some of the very old buildings? They don't seem very conducive to burning actual fires in there. Some of them are extremely shallow and don't appear to have chimneys attached to them. And there's no grating, no sort of place to actually build the fire. Very strange looking fireplaces. They seem to be connected to a metal type of device, some sort of a metal railing that runs around them. And there's always these two items, like two urns or two little spires that sit at the front of the fireplace. And there's always a metal plate at the back. And perhaps these two metal objects at the front combined in perhaps some sort of positive negative energy field and projected some sort of a beam onto the metal plate at the back or some sort of an energy onto the plate. And the plate itself was what heated up and heated the room. And a lot of these old fireplaces, they've got these setups, folks, and they really don't look very conducive to burning wood. And again, you look at the copper tops of a lot of these buildings and these devices that are all constructed on top of them, you've really got to wonder why they're there. Are they just there for decoration or is there a high function to some of these things? There's a building in Florida called the Ponce de Leon Hotel, which has got a very interesting device on top of it. And it looks like it's just some decorative thing. But when you look at the building, this device, it's very unusually shaped and it's made of metal. And it's quite an intricate little device as well. And it's not exactly in a position where people are going to be viewing it. So what's it doing there? And why go to all the trouble to make something so incredibly decorative and to put it up in the center of the roof? And this is quite a big hotel. This is a 540 room hotel. What's it doing with this metal device on the roof? And if it's just there for decorative purposes, why do they make it out of metal? You know, it's very obviously different to the rest of the building. The question is, what's it doing there? Is it just a decoration or is it actually performing some sort of function? And I would very much suggest that it is performing some sort of function and that free energy was a reality back in the middle of the last century and is very much still a reality today. 
It's just that the technology has been hidden from us. The thing is, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, I now question absolutely everything, everything that I thought I knew about history, about how we got here, and about where we're going, and about how things are really being run. Even with the mud flood, folks, I would suggest the mud flood was done via frequency, done via creating a type of an earthquake scenario. You know, when you have an earthquake, when you're in an earthquake, what happens is the Shaking causes the soil beneath you to liquefy, and that's what causes the buildings to drop. I mean, they start shaking because their foundations are unstable because the ground below them has turned to liquid. This is what I felt when I was in Mexico last year. There was a quite a big earthquake in Acapulco when I was there, about 7.2 or something, and I was on the ground floor of the Princess Palace Resort, and the entire ground of the hotel felt like we were floating, felt like we were sailing on the ocean because the whole hotel was floating on the liquid soil beneath it. And that's what happens. And if you could liquefy soil in a certain way, so that the ground either flowed down from the mountains over the villages, or the villages simply sank into the ground, this would be how you could destroy a lot of the population quite quickly. But looking at all this, I think they are preparing to do it again pretty soon. I really do. I think we are heading for a new reset or whatever you want to call it. But I think they are probably deciding that this population is waking up a little bit too much and that it's time to pull the plug on them. And I think that is very much on the cards, folks. I would suggest that is why they are rolling this whole 5G system out. And also things like, as I mentioned a few times before, someone I was speaking to, an engineer that I was speaking to a couple of years ago who builds bridges and buildings, and he's always built bridges with a 100-year lifespan, but now he's been instructed that the new bridges they're building only need to be constructed with a 15-year lifespan. And that was two years ago. So I think we're heading for another reset, folks. I think they're going to do it again. I think they've done it several times before. And as I said, I think history is very different. When I look at this and I really take in the fact that this architecture exists all around the world, really look at the mud flood and really let the concept of these tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of foundlings being shipped all around the world really sink in. I begin to question everything. Like I said, I begin to question the slave trade, what really happened with the slave trade, how these people were moved around. I question how the white people got everywhere. Were the white people the emissaries of Tartaria? Because it wasn't just black people who were being enslaved. It was everybody who was being enslaved. And not only that, it was mainly children who were being enslaved and sent out as workers all around the world. So who set this whole thing up? Who set it up to have all these races hating each other and fighting against each other and arguing about their past and things that happened in the past, none of which they can be actually sure of occurring at all? Because all we've got is this false history we've been fed. Nothing that we're fed makes any sense at all. Quite literally everything that we're told about pretty well everything has been a lie, ladies and gentlemen. I know that's a really difficult thing for people to come to terms with and a lot of people don't have time to investigate it anyway because they're too busy running on the treadmill and a lot of people are just too indifferent to the past. A lot of people don't think history is important because they're too concerned about what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah, so it's people's indifference to history that has really allowed this cover-up and hiding of this lost civilization that existed so recently and the hiding of Tartaria and Atlantis and even the mud flood and all of this stuff to be so effectively removed from human memory. And of course this indifference has been programmed into people. Many people are indifferent without even knowing that they're being that way. And this removal of our history from the collective consciousness is really an integral part of the control grid because really that's what it's all about is control and just returning to the opening quote for a few minutes indifference and apathy truly are two of the biggest problems we face in the world today and two of the things that have allowed the system to reach the point of control that it's come to 
The issue being that people in the modern world don't really involve themselves in their lives, apart from going out and working and collecting their slave dollars. It's really important that people involve themselves in their lives, and it's very important that people involve themselves in the world. As once said by Plato, the price men pay for indifference to public affairs is to be ruled by evil men, and that is certainly apparent in the world today. As I said, you know, they just become indifferent to everything. Click a few buttons and the job's done. Click a few buttons and you find your way here. Click a few buttons and this happens and that happens. You don't have to think for yourself. The phone does it all for you. I mean, really, it's about a loss of life skills and it's about control and ultimately it's about surveillance. And this is how it's done, folks, and this is why the control grid is able to perpetuate. The way it does is why it's able to continue, because people simply don't notice it because they're too distracted doing other things. But like I said, the other things they're doing are virtually nothing. And the real world is going through some drastic changes around them. Indeed, it's gone through some drastic changes already. And you think about it, folks, if they've flooded the world, if they've done all this stuff, brought all these children, all these foundlings, created this whole new culture, this whole new society, they built it up to a certain point, and if they needed to wipe the people out, well, this would be a perfect way to do it. You know, get people enslaved to this monetary system which limits their potential, causes a barrier to be erected between them and reality, a barrier of scarcity whereby they've got to collect paper in order to pay to be alive, gradually lead them into this digital system, lead it to a point where they've got to carry this device around with them in order to perform everyday functions. This device gives you the ability to be able to track everybody, locate anybody at any given time, record any conversation everybody's having, literally surveil every aspect of everybody's lives. And if you really needed to, if the situation got to a point where you were found out, you could simply switch the whole system over to active denial and fry them. Now this whole 5G grid they're setting up, the electromagnetic system they're setting up, you've got to wonder exactly what can be done with this. I mean, we know it's going to be used for communication. We know they can target individuals specifically for active denial. But what else can they do with it? Could it somehow be hooked up with HARP? Could it somehow be hooked up to send out a pulse to cause an earthquake? Could it somehow be used as a means to create an electromagnetic pulse that would liquefy the soil and create a mud flood? I mean, did they do this last time? Who knows how they did it, folks, but there is certainly a lot more to this 5G grid than meets the eye. 